start with some sort of you know, distinctions about what types of innovation are out there. And then and only then can we then move on and say, well, how do those different types of innovation create different types of outcome, hopefully positive outcomes, yeah? So we can't say innovation is inherently good and good stuff happens, because it's not true. But we can say certain types of innovation are likely to lead to certain types of outcome. That's what we need to get to, uh, if you like, in this session. So we need to understand the relationships between these. Okay, question to you. You're doing all the work today, aren't you? It's very good. Here are one, two, three. We have three companies and one consortia. Consortia, consortium. I don't know what the plural is. Who cares? Okay. Who create value in different ways, I would argue. Okay. They're different sectors, but that's almost irrelevant. You could have four in the same sector and they can create value. So you don't have to create value. In fact, it's best not to create value in exactly the same way as your competitor, because then you're going head to head. Yeah? So I've chosen these just to illustrate how broad the framework is. So tell me, how does Amazon create value? I assume you're familiar with Amazon and its products and services. How does Amazon create value? There are a few ways, but there aren't many. Saving time. Hmm? Saving time. Saving time, certainly, yeah. Yeah, you don't, no, not always. A lot of people spend a lot of time online. But the idea is you don't have to go down physical shops and do stuff like that. But certainly, yeah. Ease of use, time saving is certainly one of the claims, yeah. Free delivery. Could be free if you're on Prime, whatever it is, but certainly if you're willing to pay very rapid delivery, and if you're in certain cities, you know, almost before the money's left your account. Certainly fast, you know, lo lower price, not always, but certainly, yeah. Variety. Yeah, they started off a very niche, all the best-selling books and wider books and then music and then films. And now it's almost everything, which is how it started off when it was originally envisioned, you know, sort of shop of the world sort of thing. Um, and it's getting there. It's even have food produced in certain areas, like within the M25 and stuff like that. So it's slowly, you know, baby steps add into it. So the variety. So if you went into a bookshop, even a good bookshop in London, it wouldn't have the variety that Amazon, in theory, can deliver within 24 hours. Yeah? Because they don't have massive warehouses scattered throughout the regions. Okay, so there's three or four things there. I would argue in isolation, none of those would infer a great competitive advantage. And what you find in terms of managing innovation is normally sort of two or three different types of innovation combining in some way to create a relative, not necessarily unique, it's a bit strong, but, but a relatively rare combination. So it's very rarely great logistics, that's about the delivery and warehousing, or great user interface, okay? It's normally those two plus maybe a third thing, yeah? So you're beginning to see that it's usually a combination that creates this sort of rare ability to innovate in certain ways, okay? Some successful, some not so successful. What about Ryanair? It's been in the news recently, those who have been in the UK. Ryanair has very temporarily had some glitches with its pilot rosters, but let's ignore that for the moment, yeah? Sorry? New market segments, yeah. One of the arguments generally, not necessarily Ryanair. Ryanair was one of the pioneers in Europe, but wasn't the pioneer. The pioneers were sort of southwest in, in, in the US. Um, and Ryanair explicitly benchmarked those and, and grew it. And that's fine. You know, imitation's great and you can adapt it. So the low-cost airlines generally, whether they be in Europe or Asia or, or, or Latin America, um, yeah, certainly one of the things is not necessarily to compete directly with incumbents, although they're at the margin they do that. But the evidence suggests is that create new demand. Yeah, partly because the lower cost and the lower prices, two separate things, yeah? Lower cost and lower prices means it can reach those who wouldn't normally fly. They might have other transportation or not travel at all. So that's creating new demand. Yeah, there is overlap and there is sort of direct competition, but actually the big, if you like, revolution has been that creating new segments, as you right to say. What other types of innovation does it use to create value? So certainly creating new segments. What they call it was a blue ocean strategy, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. You know, rather than competing head on, yeah, we're going to destroy, you know, British Airways is not terribly difficult, but we're going to destroy it. So actually we're not. We're going to go around the margin and create new demand and we may we may overlap a bit, but our main business is to sidestep that. You know? And that's much smarter. So certainly segment, if you like, creation, what other innovations do the lo low cost airlines there's a clue in the title by the way. What do the low cost airlines do? Process innovation, go back to your point earlier. It's often not visible. You know, we tend to emphasize that the, there aren't any agents and so they get the margin on that. Big deal. You, know, you can book exclusively online. Again, big deal these days. Yeah, but that 
combined with an absolute obsession with driving cost out of the process. Usually successful, but not always. We see recently with the pilots. Yeah? But generally speaking, you know, examining everything, trying to understand where the costs are and driving them out permanently, which I'd argue is process innovation. Yeah? Redesigning the process, looking for waste and such like. So it's not just cutting prices. Anyone can do that for a short period. And, and that's been the major innovation, you know, fundamentally different processes. Yeah? And they've learned from other sectors, as we'll talk about later in the, in the course. Go down to your far left, our friend Apple. Well, we sort of discussed it briefly earlier. You know, what, what are the sort of three or four ways that Apple creates value? Whether you love them or hate them, nobody's in between, are they? But how does Apple create value? What are the ways in which Apple creates value? Because again, whether you're a pro or anti-Apple, they create value, believe me. You know, the same physical product has got like 30% margin rather than 5% margin, so they generally create value. Certainly, yeah, certainly, yeah, the interface and the whole experience thing. And there's a very large segment, it's not universal, it's, you know, um, otherwise it'd have world domination. But certainly there is a large enough segment where that experience, almost a prescribed experience, if you get it right, is of high value to people, yeah? And some of that is the physical thing, the aesthetics. Some of it is the user experience. And some of it just plain branding, your point earlier, if you keep banging on about being the the Maverick and outside, even when you're mainstream, you can, you can create premium pricing. So there's two or three things happening there once again. And again, illustrate it. And the bottom right hand one, you probably don't care about, but our vice chancellor at the university wakes up in a, I don't know personally, but cold sweat every day about it. So there's a big thing in the US, particularly US, UK, and Netherlands and Germany, which are sort of most progressive of these, this idea of a mass um, open online courses, which are largely free. So the point being is, for different reasons, individuals, institutions, normally very rich institutions, you know, like Caltech and MIT, will put certain modules online, sort of for free, um, but often there's a registration or a certification thing to pay for this, for the um, basic uh, hardware and maintenance, such like. And there's also some, uh, some more commercial organisations that are coming in and charging other fees. They're trying to monetize it in some way. But certainly the idea is to offer alternatives to this, I guess. How could that be, I hear you ask. Uh, but certainly it's alternative. And much like the low-cost airlines, at least now, and these have only been running you know, four or five years outside the US anyway, and they're quite large, but they're quite small in the whole time. It's actually, there's not, at the moment, direct competition. They're actually serving new segments. And it's people who actually want to learn, you know, rather than get <laughs> pieces of paper and stuff. I'm not suggesting the two things don't overlap, but I'm saying it's a different segment, okay? And that's interesting to say, will it, will it pan out like low-cost airlines where they can coexist? Or would it generally sort of disrupt, to use an overused term, yeah? Okay, so what we're saying is two things. You know, like there are different flavours of innovation happening here. Some process, some product, yeah? Some about cost, some about differentiation. That's the first thing. The second thing is, but in isolation, it's not like a one innovation creates competitive advantage. It's often two or three of these things interact in some consistent way, okay? And that's what you find with these things, okay? And that's what we should be looking for. Okay, so um, so how can we expand our language, our vocabulary? Um, well, we covered most of these, I think. We've been playing around with this sort of lexicon, if you like, for many, many years, and we haven't got it right yet, particularly the paradigm on which we still hate, but it's a sort of a, a residue category to put the other stuff in, which we'll talk about in a moment. So product, product, we sort of think we know what we mean by product, don't we? Yeah? It's more about the outcome. It's what you what you acquire or use or such like. Even then it gets a bit difficult because you argue, well, what are services? Are they products? And there's lots of research trying to understand the interaction between physical products and less tangible services. And we'll talk about that when we look at, look at product and service development. I think it's week nine or something. Okay, so it's a big deal, as I suggested earlier with some of the examples. But generally speaking, it's what, it's like what you experience. It may be a product, it may be a service experience, or it might be a combination thereof. Okay, so that's one, if you like, space in which you can play around with innovation. Second one we briefly mentioned, uh, a couple of examples, process. Now process innovation, we shall argue again and again and again, and again and again and again, for the whole 13 weeks and more. Process innovation is probably the unsung hero. So in terms of academic research, and in terms of management practice, you know, everyone concentrates on product innovation and product development, yeah? And there's only a relatively small number of studies and small number of good examples from companies of process innovation, yeah? 
Partly because it tends to be buried in organisations, so it's harder to study and it's harder to manage. You know, a new product, it's very interesting, it's shiny, it's visible quite often, and so people want to study it and they want to manage it. So product innovation we know a hell of a lot about, both in theory and in practice, and we can learn from that, and that's fine. But actually process innovation, if you look at the evidence, yeah, it's very powerful and underutilised. So we will again and again reintroduce process innovation and so say it needs to be practised much more than it is currently. Okay? And most of the interest, the most of the talent, and most of the resources still go to product innovation, whereas the evidence suggests there's a lot of potential for process innovation. Okay? And if you look at you know, a lot of these you know, household names, you scratch below the shiny surface and there's lots of interesting process innovation going on. Okay? And that's great, because it's hard to imitate. Yeah, much harder to imitate than a new product. Okay, position, it starts to get a little less well-defined then. Okay, uh, Position is more about, it could be product, could be process, it could be neither, but it's really the context in which the product or service or process is used. So if it's used in a different way, yeah, it can infer different benefits. So it's a bit like um, sort of cross-market learning. You apply a whole, it could be from a business to business, say to a business to consumer market, and you switch markets as different benefits. Okay, so how you position it creates new benefits and new users. But the focal innovation may not change. So for example, you get lots of things that come from the military, historically, that end up being consumer products after some lag. More recently, it's gone the other direction. Okay, as military spending has been cut. Um, so a lot of consumer innovations have then become military, for example. And the least well-defined one, but we had to have a P because it's alliteration. There's a lot of alliteration in, in, in marketing. Um, so we've got product, process, position. Paradigm is the least well-defined. It's all the other stuff. Yeah. So things like uh, business model innovation. You'll hear a lot about business model innovation over the next 13, 14 weeks. Why? Because it's one of these sort of buzzwords that has re-energized managers, consultants, and such like. So every few years, something comes along. Yeah like open innovation, disruptive innovation. Everyone gets excited and they use the term. And it's good stuff. It's not normally new, but the term's new. So paradigm includes things like, how do we create value? And that might be numerous ways, yeah? So business model innovation is a good example of that. Okay, and we'll cover all this. So it's a way of trying to capture more and more moving beyond simply product, process, and service. Now, whether you do draw a box or a box on its size that looks like a diamond or a circle, who cares, yeah? Um, but you need a diagram, don't you? And the only thing that adds to what we've just said, really, is in any of those dimensions, okay, you can have degrees of innovation. So it could be quite incremental, or it could be more radical. Okay, now two observations with that. And they're really, really important. Okay, first observation is incremental is not better or worse than radical. It's different. Okay, that's the really important thing. So in some cases, it's best to manage incremental innovation. Yeah. And in other cases, it's best to go for radical innovation. So it's not universal that one is better than the other. It's not a hierarchy. Again, it's important to know that because a lot of companies, shiny, shiny, you know, the more radical, the better. It's got to be better than a more incremental one. Not necessarily. So understanding you know, context and conditions is terribly important. So don't assume that. So that's the first observation. Second observation is, how you manage incremental innovation is often fundamentally different to how you manage radical innovation. So it's not additive. It's not more and more incremental innovation equals radical, yeah? or that incremental is a subset of radical. They're different. So how you manage them, how you resource them, how you measure them are different. So you need to figure out quite early on, case by case, you know, what do we need to do here on the different dimensions? Is it an incremental issue? Is it a more radical one? And then manage it appropriately. Okay, and that's a big mistake real organisations make. So you need to figure out. For example, when, when might incremental be, if you like, superior to radical? Because you tend to think radical is inherently more innovative. But when, either real examples or, or more abstractly, in what conditions do you think incremental might be more relevant? We had an example already, but well, uncertainty. Yeah. yeah, good point. Well, there's two there's two views on that, and we'll talk about those when we look at innovation strategy in two weeks' time. 
You're dead right, but there are two conclusions you can draw from that. So the observation was, if you didn't hear, under conditions of uncertainty, and that's certainly one of the factors that affects it. How it affects it is more subtle, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks when we look at strategy. But basically, you're dead right. The degree of uncertainty, so let's assume you've got a very uncertain environment, yeah? You don't know what customers want, there's regulation, there's lots of competitors, the worst possible scenario, yeah? Now, there are two schools of thought on that, and we won't discuss it in detail today, we'll look at a couple of weeks' time, but one response is, say, for grief, there's so much uncertainty out there, let's tread carefully, so it's incremental, yeah? Experimental, let's try it, because it's so un everything's moving, it's so uncertain, yeah? So that's one strategy. A counter-strategy might be saying, well, actually, yeah, there's so many degrees of freedom here that we can throw in some more radical things and they might stick. Now, which is the best strategy it depends on lots of things like resources, capabilities, and such like. But certainly you're right. One of the things that would determine that is the degree of uncertainty, particularly in the environment. Yeah? And we'll talk about that when we look at strategy in two weeks and when we look at forecast in, I think, week seven or eight. Okay? Okay, so don't get too bogged down, particularly in the paradigm stuff, um, but you see the general idea. Two things. One, there are different types of innovation. That's really important to get, and often they interact. And secondly, the different degrees, yeah? And the incremental is not necessarily better or worse, but it's different to radical, and how you manage and resource it is different. Okay, 